and thanks for this invitation to be here. So energy versus pressures and where to focus. And there is no relevant conflict of interest for this presentation. And um, uh, this concept of energy was introduced uh, some years ago and uh, more or less at the same time that we introduced the concept of driving pressure some years ago. Um, first, uh, a little bit of definitions. The driving pressure, and we have discussed this yesterday, is uh, the swings in alveolar pressure. You need zero flow conditions to estimate driving pressure. So we are proposing that we use short inspiratory pause, not long inspiratory pause. And the reason for, for this is can be found here. So in red, we have alveolar pressure measured with a very thin catheter inside the bronchial tree. And then you do an inspiratory pause and you see something like this. So the alveolar pressure has also a peak. And then because of the stress relaxation of the lung, you make an equilibrium after a long plateau pressure used in classic mechanics. And then you can, may have a difference of three to five centimeters of water in plateau pressure. So if I had a very slow inspiratory flow, my peak alveolar pressure would be equivalent to this long plateau pressure. But if, if I'm using tidal ventilation with short inspiratory time, my peak alveolar pressure and the peak stress in the lung is really much higher than when I had a, a longer plateau plateau pressure. So in reality, you have to use a short inspiratory pause to estimate the driving pressure. Why? Because then you capture this component of stress, which is very important. And as has been shown by some investigators, for instance, Proti was trying to define the role of inspiratory flow in ventilator induced lung injury. And then he was promoting the, this is from classic mechanics, the terminology of P1, which is the pressure that you achieve during a quasi instantaneous inspiratory pause or the classical plateau pressure after five seconds. And this difference can be three to five centimeters of water in patients with ARDS, sometimes six, seven. And then whenever this difference was increasing because the, fast, the faster is the, is, is the inspiration, the higher is this difference between P1 and P2 because you don't have time during inspiration to have a stress relaxation. And then this tiny difference of a few centimeters of water was enough to promote lung, oh, sorry, to promote lung edema in some animals. So when you are very close to the limit of lung injury, this few centimeters of water can make a difference. And this is why some old studies about ventilator induced lung injury have shown that if you slow the flow, the inspiration, you can decrease a little bit ventilator induced lung injury. It's a moderate effect because the maximum amount of difference that you can get is a few centimeters of water on this. So. I'm just saying this because when we talk about driving pressure, you have to realize that this concept includes its, the effect of flow, fast inspiratory time, short inspiratory time. And then in this study uh, published in the New England, most of the patients, they use a short inspiratory time to calculate uh, driving pressure. This was performed because of practical reasons, but I'm just mentioning that if you use short inspiratory time, typically 0.3 to 0.5 seconds, you incorporate most of the effects of flow on ventilator induced lung injury. The second thing about this concept of driving pressure that it's important is that uh, driving pressure has a kind of priority of risks as compared with plateau pressure. This was also part of the paper in the New England. So we stratified patients in four subgroups. Here is the airway pressure profile. Here is the famous limit of 30, 
which was arbitrarily created. And then we have patients with low driving pressure and high driving pressure. <clears throat> but in these four subcategories, we have patients with high plateau pressure and low plateau pressure. These patients, they are very easy to predict because they have low driving pressure and low plateau pressure, and then very likely they have low risk of death. These patients also are very easy to predict the prognosis because they have high plateau pressure and high swing, swings in airway pressure, so they have a very bad prognosis like shown here. So twice the mortality. But the interesting thing is to imagine what happens with these two contradicting categories in terms of uh, risks. So they have competing risks. Patients with low driving pressure but high plateau pressure and vice versa. So which one is at a safer condition? The answer is very clear in this uh, paper. So these patients with higher driving pressure and lower plateau pressure, they have worse prognosis. Okay, so it's from, in terms of priority of risks, it's better to stay at this condition than this. This is interesting because we have been talking a lot about uh, static strain or static um, stress, and this information is contradicting this. Pay attention to this. And this is part of the paper published in the New England. So we better stay at a higher mean airway pressure, but lower swings in driving pressure. So from in the lung perspective and from the cell perspective, and this has been shown in many physiological studies with cultures of cells, cyclic deformation is much worse than absolute deformation. And an analogy with our bedside physiology is that you should pay attention more to the swings in pressure, not to the sustained pressures. And, uh, and this is, has a lot to do with some the biological behavior of tissues. Tissues and cells, they can adapt in size. And this has been shown in culture of cells. The cells can adapt in size, covering the holes created in the membrane when you stretch them, if this is slowly performed. And then the second point that it's important to understand in, in this paper is that uh, it's uh, in the middle of the tables, is that when you compare, let's say in a univariate analysis, driving pressure and plateau pressure, both of them, they have a relationship with survival. But there is a big difference. When you adjust for confoundings and confounders, Driving pressure is a strong predictor of survival while plateau pressure is not. So no wonder that in many papers in the literature, if you do, uh, let's say, a kind of poor adjustment for baseline disease, plateau pressure seems to be a good predictor of survival. But plateau pressure incorporates lots of the baseline disease of patients because if you think about plateau pressure, incorporates a little bit of the PEEP effect which is driven by PO2, FiO2 ratio, which is related to baseline disease, while the driving pressure is much more related to the strategy that you apply to the patient. Okay, can be a little bit related to compliance, but we have proven that it's independent of compliance. In animal studies performed overnight, it's very clear that driving pressure has a very strong role in ventilator-induced lung injury, much more than plateau pressure. For instance, in these long-term pig experiments, we promoted lung injury, and then after promoting lung injury, we applied similar plateau pressures in two groups of animals, so the same level of maximum stress or sustained stress, but different driving pressures, manipulating with PEEP and a little bit of tidal volume, but much more with PEEP. And uh, the difference is, is striking. 
So this is the animals with high cyclic stress, and they are using the PEEP promoted by the ArtsNet table. And when we tried to optimize PEEP, uh, I know that the previous presentation was saying that this is not possible, but it's clear that in animals, this is possible. You see this difference here is just because of a kind of optimization. So the problem is that we failed systematically in applying this in patients. So, but this does not, does not mean that this should not be pursued. And we have shown also that this is uh, true also in terms of lung inflammation examined by PET. The interesting thing is that uh, in the last years also lots of information they, is coming out from these studies showing that the reduction in driving pressure is not only important for the short-term prognosis but also for the long-term prognosis because driving pressure is related to the collagen production in the lung because the fibroblasts, they sense the tension in the alveolar septum and this is, has been shown also in patients with lung fibrosis. They have a very good survival to the point that their daily driving pressure to cope with minute ventilation exceeds a certain value which is around 12 to 15 centimeters of water. And uh, we have shown recently that survivors of ARDS, six months of ARDS, they still have lots of lung fibrosis. But the interesting, six months later, you can still track this relationship between the driving pressure applied during the first week of mechanical ventilation and vital capacity. And the same is not true for tidal volume or for plateau pressure. There is no relationship with the long-term uh, vital capacity. Um, okay, let me skip this. In experimental studies, also, if you take strips of lung cells, it's very easy to show that uh, you can dissociate changes in volume and changes in pressure applied to the alveolar septum. And then they were trying to understand which of these two factors, the force or the amplitude, is much more related to the cr creation of lung fibrosis. And in this study, the force, which is proportional to driving pressure, was the important factor promoting lung fibrosis and lung inflammation. The amplitude per se, or the tidal volume per se, was not. Why this? Because there is lots of physiological studies showing that if your lung has a good alveolar surface, when you increase tidal volume, there is lots of unfolding not necessarily tension. And the problem for the lung tissue is to create a lot of tension in the alveolar septum. And this fits very well with this data in patients. This is also part of the New England paper about driving pressure. When we increase driving pressure, we always have an increase in barotrauma, like this. And also with a threshold around this region of 15 to 16, which should be not strictly Consider, but it's interesting because you can increase tidal volume up to 12 ml per kilogram without any increase in barotrauma, provided that your driving pressure is not increasing too much. So there is a dissociation between these two factors, and this is very important for the next topic that we are going to talk, which is about energy. So from the Perspective of lung rupture, typically, and this is some papers about regional lung mechanics, it's very clear that when you're very close to the limit of rupture, like this portion of the curve, in that slight changes in lung volume, they are creating very high changes in delta pressure, in stress, in cyclic stress. So when you are very close to the limit of rupture, it's very inefficient to look at variations in volume because tiny variations in volume can produce very large variations in alveolar tension and the septum tension. 
So it's much better to look at pressures. Um, so many years ago, Didier Dreyfus said that uh, we should not use the term barotrauma. trauma. But uh, we also believe that this word, volutrauma, is also misleading because there is plenty of literature, and I think now this paper about driving pressure is telling us that following a target of tidal volume can be very misleading because the respiratory system is very insensitive to changes in tidal volume. It's much more sensitive to changes in driving pressure. And one of the reasons we have stated a lot is a situation like this. We have two patients, one with good compliance, one with bad compliance. You apply exactly the same tidal volume and you, we just use some equations from textbooks. You can calculate here a low transpulmonary pressure, a high transpulmonary pressure, and this is enough to cause alterations in permeability and barotrauma. So tidal volume per se cannot be important. You have to normalize tidal volume to lung size. And this is exactly if you divide, equivalent to dividing tidal volume by compliance, which is proportional to the size of this baby lung. And this is exactly driving pressure. So driving pressure is tidal volume normalized to the size of the baby lung. This is important. There has practical consequences. For instance, in this particular patient with lung fibrosis treated in our ICU, he was under, undergoing open lung biopsy here, and then we had to do one lung ventilation. We asked the anesthesiologist to perform protective ventilation, and he did it. He applied 6 ml per kilogram, plateau pressure of 29, and the end result was this ground glass opacity appearing that happened in just one hour of mechanical ventilation for this one lung ventilation. This patient evolved to acute respiratory failure with exacerbation of lung fibrosis and diet. Why? Because the anesthesiologist focused on tidal volume and forgot about this. So I like to say that in this particular patient, he received 24 ml per kilogram. Why? Because lung compliance was already half. So he should receive half tidal volume. And then, because he was just ventilated with one lung, should be one quarter of the tidal volume. And in, in reality, this patient received six mLs per kilogram, which would be equivalent to 24. So I think we should avoid the two terms. Okay, um, then it's, uh, it's a little bit tricky because then we should say this very long word, transpulmonary driving pressure. And in reality, in the paper, we are not promoting transpulmonary driving pressure just because it's, uh, it's a measurement problem at the bedside. You need an esophageal balloon to measure transpulmonary. But in fact, it's what we mean. So this is what the parenchyma is sensing. Okay, then we came to this concept of power, which was promoted uh, a few years ago. In this concept of power, we are saying that uh, the respiratory system is working like a machine, and then we have to calculate the total energy driving the machine. And then you have to compute all these parameters that you can find, you can set some of them at the ventilator, except the elastance that is, and the resistance that are intrinsic properties of the system. So Luciano Gattinoni has suggested that the higher the mechanical power, which is the energy per unit of time, the higher the lung edema. So for me, the problem of mechanical power is the fact that it's affected by all ventilatory parameters. For instance, this is mechanical power. This is the increment in each of the parameters you have here. Tidal volume, flow, driving pressure, respiratory rate, and PEEP. And all of them, they are causing a 
very large increase in mechanical power, which means that everything counts. And for me, when you have a complex scenario and everything counts, it's very confusing because you don't have any priority to act and to choose. And I think this information could be misleading. Not only this, you know, in the last years, um, uh, the people who is dealing with uh, mechanical power is also dividing mechanical power in static and dynamic, which for me, it's very confused and it's also a kind of uh, analogy between lung and a machine and which is not true in reality. And we have many physiological studies and cell studies showing that this comparison is very, is, can be very misleading. In fact, some studies have shown that instead of calculating all these areas, which is proportional to the total mechanical power, you should calculate the dissipated work, which is the energy transferred from the ventilator, which is going to cause cell damage, should be disease to resist area. Two minutes. Um, and then in the physiological studies, when you try to calculate this hysteresis area, it's very nice to show that this area is much more proportional to the driving pressure than exactly to this mechanical power. So we tried to check this concept in this same population of patients uh, in which we applied the driving pressure concept. So we have in total 3,000 patients. So here I'm putting the relative risk of death and each respiratory parameter. Okay. So if you look at here, this is just the confirmation of the results of the driving pressure paper. So from all the respiratory parameters, only driving pressure and respiratory rate to a certain extent, they are related to the risk of death of patients. And then, if we then try to compute power, power is a worse predictor than driving pressure. So this is very important. Why, why this is happening? Because power is introducing back some terms that we had avoided when we established the driving pressure concept. Power is including here tidal volume. And we have shown that tidal volume per se can be a little bit misleading if you are not considering tidal volume in relation to lung compliance. So, in fact, in a multivariate analysis, power is a much worse and insignificant predictor of death if compared with driving pressure. And here we can also see something very interesting. If I compare the effects of driving pressure, which is this black dot and respiratory rate, I can see a difference of five times in terms of magnitude of effect. Why this is important? Because then I can imagine that if I take one single term, that, which is driving pressure and respiratory rate, this would be the best predictor. This is the first consequence. But also, it's important because you, you, I can think that this whole equation is complicating the subject. And not only this, this equation is artificially overemphasizing the respiratory rate role. So then I have a very important question here that I would like to solve. At the bedside, is it worth to decrease tidal volume or driving pressure by 20% if I have to increase the respiratory rate by 20%, according to this uh, framework, looks that the response is yes. We tested this in some animals. So we took some animals with lung injury. Here, they, we applied a normal driving pressure and six ml per kilogram and then we kept the same PCO2 levels and increased the respiratory rate. So which of these animals is going to be more protected? Here the power is just 15. Here the power is double, okay? So which one is going to be more protected? 
This is the driving pressure. So one animal had a low driving pressure around 10. The other animal had a driving pressure around 15, but a much lower respiratory rate and a much lower power. So this is the animal with high driving pressure. So after injury, 24 hours later, keeping what we call protective ventilation, the injury progressed. Why? Because driving pressure was high despite low power. And now vice versa. Low driving pressure, but a high power because my respiratory rate is very high, injury decreased. So I think this is a, a, a experimental result confirming the results of uh, the paper in the New England Journal. So driving pressure can give you the priority. And then at the bedside, it's much better to consider driving pressure instead of calculating this complicated term, which is energy or power. And this gives us also a very nice framework to work because we can understand here that driving pressure has a priority over plateau pressure, over tidal volume, and over also respiratory rate. Thank you very much.